Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I am Josiah Neely. I am the Texas Director and a Senior Fellow in Energy Policy at the R Street Institute. Um, R Street, one of the, our, our visions or missions is to focus on important but low salience issues. And of course, recently the what counts as a low salience issue has kind of expanded a lot because there's a lot of really big issues in the news. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is something that is definitely uh, important and has a lot of implications uh, for areas of energy policy and also state federal policy. Um, so uh, on April 14th, a petition was filed with uh, FERC, the Federal uh, Electric Regulator. Uh, it was filed by the, the New England Ratepayer Association, and uh, this is a petition to try and get uh, FERC to claim exclusive jurisdiction over all wholesale sales of uh, energy that's generated uh, behind the meter, so the customer end. Um, and there's, there's many uh, different ways that that could happen, but uh, one, one common thing that people think of is if you have solar panels on your home, you're generating electricity, um, uh, that, that's a source there. And of course, uh, the, while not limited specifically to this, the kind of impetus for this was um, an attempt to take uh, state and localities, take away from state and localities the authority to do so-called net metering programs, which is where uh, someone who generates elect their own electricity, perhaps they are generating more during certain times of the day than they can use. Other times of the day, they aren't gener generating enough, so they're taking electricity off the grid. Uh, and net metering is a way for them to be able to get rid of the excess. And there, there's all sorts of details that we'll hear about that. So um, this would, I think, be uh, a really big deal if FERC were to grant this petition and try and take exclusive jurisdiction uh, over behind the meter generation. Uh, assuming that uh, they're legally able to do so, uh, which is probably something that we'll talk about. Uh, but it has big, uh, big implications, not only for the development of uh, the electric system, but also for state federal relations. Um, and so we have today to talk about that and those issues, a distinguished panel. Um, uh, we have uh, Chairman Ted J. Thomas of the Arkansas Public Services Commission, uh, it, joining us from uh, Arkansas. We have in Phoenix, Landon Stevens, who's the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Conservative Energy Network. And we also have uh, our street associate fellow, uh, Chris Villarreal. Uh, just kind of a, a, a note on how we're gonna proceed. Um, first off, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it in, in a second. I'm going to turn it over to each of the panelists to kind of give a, an opening statement, kind of their thoughts on uh, the matter. And then we'll have some uh, discussion and questions. And if you as participants have questions that you would like to see addressed, uh, you can put that into the chat and I will try uh, to get those, get those answered. So uh, with that, uh, Chairman, uh, you uh, won the coin flip or lost the coin flip, however you want to call it, so you're first. Okay, thanks, sir, and thank you for having us. Uh, these sorts of discussions are uh, good and valuable, in my view, as we work on these policies. Of course, the NERO petition is about jurisdiction over net metering, so my initial comments will be to state why I think jurisdiction and net metering are important. What is the importance of jurisdiction and net metering? And I look forward uh, to any questions later on in the other uh, panelists' presentations as well. Jurisdiction, as George W. Bush once famously said, I am the decider. Jurisdiction is who is the decider. And most people think uh, they should be the decider. The Senate thinks it should be the decider. The House thinks it should be the decider. The committees think they should be the decider. The executive branch and the courts think they should be the decider. And the states think they should be the decider. And it all plays out. But, but to me, for these issues to have more meaning, it has to be 
I should be the more than I should be the decider. And I think Tony Clark did a good job of pointing this out in a recent utility dive. There needs to be principle. But to me, the principle should be we need to resolve the jurisdictional disputes so that litigation over jurisdiction doesn't create a barrier to innovation and technology. To me, that is my guiding principle with respect to jurisdiction. How do we get jurisdiction litigation out of the way so it doesn't create uncertainty over technology investment? Um, I was fortunate uh, to be asked by Nehru to lead the working group that prepared the petition. Um, I was very happy with the work product. We had a broad consensus. Um, even states with different views on these topics came together on this one. There's an old Southern political saying, it's stronger than a garlic milkshake. I thought our comments were strong. Um, and of course, I'll, um, you have to make that call before the FERC rules. We'll see uh, if the FERC agrees. The same principle also uh, led me to be an outlier in terms of state commissioners with respect to the appeal of 841. Um, and there's differences of opinion, but get the technology dispute or get the jurisdiction out of the way of the technology dispute, uh, to me is the right way to go. Um, if you want more detail on that, look at comments filed by the Arkansas Commission in March of 2019 and RM 18-9 is to me where you draw the line to get the right line or close enough on the right line so we can quit fighting that jurisdiction and turn to the technology. Why is the technology so important? To me, there are two big risks that the technology addresses. One is climate risk and the second is related, and that is spending on climate that doesn't mitigate the problem. To me, those are two risks, and both parties kind of take different views on those risks. I think they're both um, serious and that we need to take care of them, you know, and the, the spending thing is a concern. What happens if we spend and spend and spend and spend on this problem and you still see the temperature slowly drifting upwards as if we were doing nothing? That is a risk as well. The potential winner is technology. Technology is how we will solve that problem in the long run. And, and that leads to point two, why is net metering important? Net mirror is important in my state because what we're seeking to do is take our traditional rooftop solar net mirroring law and morph it into a broader solar self supply law uh, that together with other policies on demand response and other issues, uh, we will hope will represent an embrace of technology um, in a way that serves consumers and protects us from climate risk at the same time. And uh, I'll also point out that um, our, my co-panelist, Chris Bill Real, is involved in that and is working as a facilitator in our working group. Uh, and we, I really appreciate that. One of the principal drivers of, of our need to, in my view, embrace net metering and, and morph it into solar self-supply is driven by a fear that the center right will get rolled on the climate debate. I don't think uh, we're doing a good job on that. Um, I don't think we've done a good job on a lot of issues. If you go back to 04 and look at some random primary advertisements and congressional races and look at what they're talking about and make a list, you'll see that since then we get rolled on issue after issue after issue. At some point, we need to figure out a better way to debate and discuss these issues. And it's been very frustrating to me as a state policymaker that I've tried to make this point in the energy, environment, and climate debate that I found a lack of meritocracy of ideas. We talk about these things in policy uh, circles. We talk about these things at NARUC. We deal into the details. We don't all agree on everything, but we have respectful, informed conversations. I have those kinds of conversations with people from Maine, with people from Vermont, with people from California, with people from Florida, with people from Texas, from people Alabama. We don't sit there and insult each other and, and, and carry on uh, the way they sometimes do 
in Washington, D.C. And I've pushed this message and tried to push it with what I would call the, the Republican communications and political strategy establishment in Washington, D.C. I've yet to make a millimeter of progress. Um, I find a lack of meritocracy of ideas. I can't even find a suggestion box even though when one talks about uh, political insiders, I'd probably be labeled as one. Back in the day, my favorite Democrat was Bob Beckel. I would watch him on TV. I loved Bob Beckel. The reason I loved Bob Beckel is because he would sit there and tell people what to do. And I looked at his record and he was one in five. Mm -hmm. One in five and he's telling the other ones what to do. And I'm like, this is awesome. When I sit here today and look at it's one in six in the popular vote in the, the last seven uh, uh, presidential elections, I see Bob Beckles everywhere except they're on our side. We have to do a better job of debating these issues. And what we get instead of reason, we get outrage and how everything is obvious and the opponents use that against us. Take, for example, what should be a little known congresswoman named Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's become famous as people have ridiculed her while her side is rolling their side. If they would be respectful to her, and then they could take and use reason and destroy her arguments, but they don't do that. You know, Nick Saban and Bill Belichick can be arrogant about their record. When they're one in seven, you should be embracing a meritocracy of ideas and not rejecting it. But that's what we have. And I've laid these ideas out. We filed our comments on jurisdiction with FERC in the uh, docket, um, the aggregation of uh, DER docket. It triggered a bunch of comments back and forth, um, and I've laid out in public numerous occasions how we could improve the debate. And if we were one in seven, you could pat me on the head and say, shut up, little boy. Uh, but when you're one in seven, you're not Nick Saban. There needs to be openness to ideas about how we can do this better. And until there is, we're gonna get rolled, and we're gonna get rolled, and we're gonna get rolled, and if the, DC Republicans get rolled in climate, we're going to be ready in Arkansas. We're going to protect ourselves from that rolling by embracing these technologies and trying to protect our consumers. So that's, that's the view from here. Uh, thank you for having me and I look forward to the discussion. All right. And uh, having, having uh, Grown up uh, in Texas uh, during a, a period when uh, the Dallas Cowboys, I, I think, I think we were uh, one in fourteen, one in four, fifteen, uh, one season, uh, but uh, that didn't yeah. that didn't uh, damage our pride any. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you fired the coach, okay, right. right? That's right. Yeah, and the general uh, manager. And the general manager, yes. So. Um, Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for those remarks. Uh, Landon, uh, you're up. All right. Thanks a lot, Josiah. Um, I'm glad to be here today. Um, a little bit on this, this topic and a little bit about me, I guess. I, I started at CEN uh, right about the time we went into quarantine number one. So I'm getting ready here in Arizona to enter quarantine number two. So... I don't know if that makes me experienced or what, but um, this, this topic was really important to me as I came on, um, and, and we really wanted to, to jump in and make our voice heard at CEN, um, because prior to coming to CEN, I was most recently at the Arizona Corporation Commission, uh, the PUC or the regulator there for the utilities in the state, and I worked as a policy advisor for two, two commissioners there. Um, and so this idea that uh, Chairman Thomas talks about on jurisdiction is really critical in my view. Um, just knowing the regulatory process at the state level and the amount of work and the amount of, of attention and the dialogue back and forth that goes into those discussions. Um, 
and especially when you consider net metering and it, its related policies, um, it's such a complex uh, policy that we're dealing with. Uh, and every state is so unique and different in the way its energy systems are set up. Are they part of a regional market, an RTO, an ISO? Are they not? Are they regulated? Are they deregulated? How do they generate their energy? Um, what are their costs? How do they transmit? There's just so many variables that go into this and they're all important when we're talking about um, setting these policies. And so anytime you try to take that from, you know, uh, a localized state level where you should have the most uh, accurate information and unique information and try to, you know, take that to a centralized far off uh, government regulator to set a one size fits all, um, we get a little worried about that. Um, and a little bit about the Conservative Energy Network. Uh, we engage in 21 states. We work in 21 different states across the country. And our goal is to identify and promote conservative solutions that can help us move towards a clean energy future. Uh, we feel that this transition is, is occurring and as Chairman Thomas said, now it's a matter of you know, getting that transition right um, and balancing a whole bunch of competing priorities to make good policy. And we feel that there's a, a conservative voice that is too often not heard uh, at the table in those discussions. And so we're trying to work with uh, local state officials and regulators across the country to, to add a new dynamic to those discussions. And so we, we felt once we saw this, um, petition pop up at FERC that it's right in our wheelhouse for what we do every day. Each of our 21 state organizations is unique and has its own set of priorities and, and things that they're worried about. And we know that the policy outcomes might be different in each of those 21 states. But for us, it's very important to adhere to those federalist uh, ideals that each state is a laboratory that we should be able to, um, you know, understand our own unique situation and craft policies that work for those uh, states individually. Um, and so we, we filed our comments and, and we agree that the jurisdiction is a question. Um, we argue a lot about the, the legal basis, um, the precedent that FERC itself has adopted in the past. And we just uh, feel that this is a step too far in, in overreach and taking those I'll leave the details up. I'm sure those will come up in the in the discussion as we go forward. Um, but you know, it was it was something that we felt was an area where we had to to jump in and make our voice heard. Um, and I think as as R Street pointed out either today or yesterday, uh, the the response was pretty skewed in favor of those federalist ideals versus the centralized government. And so. Uh, I think we're. I think it's good that we're having this discussion, and and hopefully we'll we'll see what the outcome looks like soon from FERC. So. All right, and uh, next we're gonna we're gonna go north to Minnesota, where it is only ninety degrees. Uh, so, uh, Chris, uh, take it away. Yes, it's only ninety degrees and humid here. So. Um, you move up to Minnesota for a reason. It's usually not it's usually not 90 degrees in humidity that you come up here for. Um, so thank you, Josiah. It's a pleasure to be on this webinar today talking about energy metering uh, with Landon and Chairman Thomas. Um, I'll keep mine, I'll try to keep mine a little bit more brief since everything that I would have said in the broader context has been said by either Chairman Thomas or Landon. And so I'll just note that um, the comments that we submitted, that Artreet submitted uh, opposing the petition by NERA, um, I'll just focus on two of the components that we discussed in our comments. And one, of course, as we've been talking about, is, is the role of federalism and the importance of having these decisions and discussions be made at the state level as opposed to trying to craft a one-size-fits-all solution for every utility across the country. Um, as we know, and as Chairman Thomas himself noted earlier, each of the states are undergoing their own analysis as to what is the appropriate response to the growth of things like rooftop solar and energy storage as they impact their energy metering solutions. And so there really isn't a need for federal 
for FERC to step in to solve the solutions when the states themselves are often and already responding to these to the growth of, of distributed energy resources like rooftop solar. And so the appropriate role at this point for FERC is simply to maintain its what it's done in the past, which is to let the states continue to work on energy metering, that these sales are not sales for electricity and wholesale co interstate commerce, and they're not wholesale sales that should then be subject to FERC jurisdiction. The second component of our comment is that even if, and this is a big if, there are cost shifts and subsidies and what have you from net energy metering, the appropriate place remains the conversation be held in the states. Because uh, every utility, is, as I am often told, is different. Um, so the cost of service and the cost and the rates that would then be impacted are incredibly local, local dependent. And to have FERC then try to attempt to, to identify what are the appropriate costs at the distribution level on a per customer basis to better understand what the rate, the retail rate should be and the retail compensation should be is simply well beyond the authority that FERC has over um, the distribution side of the system. The other thing that I would then, I would also note is um, in one sense, um, NERA is correct, and this is raised in the comments of uh, the Institute of po uh, Policy Integrity, that NEM itself might not be the best way to incentivize or compensate the services that rooftop solar could provide. Um, you know, it is a rather blunt instrument, so to speak, um, to, to compensate things like rooftop solar, but it's the best that we had at the time. And again, the states remain in the best position to figure out what should that rate be and when should net energy metering evolve to something like NEM 2.0 or looking more uh, specifically at things like value distributed resources or value of storage or some other compensation scheme when solar penetration reaches a certain threshold where there are in fact um, opportunities or cross-subsidization uh, cross that is occurring. But in the vast majority of the states around the country with the exception of a handful, um, the growth of distributed energy resources like rooftop solar uh, is simply not large enough to really have a sufficient impact on these cost subsidies. And again, if there are cost subsidies, the best entity to look at that would remain the state commission since they're the ones who are there reviewing utility distribution infrastructure costs, they're the ones developing the retail rates, and they're the ones with the policy chops to really understand how each individual distribution utility is investing and responding uh, to these customer choices and then in conjunction with the guidance from the legislature uh, to determine what is the appropriate policy direction for each individual state. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to the conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I would like to, to jump off uh, what you were just saying, Chris, because it seems to me there, there are kind of two uh, broad policy questions here, uh, leaving aside the legal niceties of do they actually have the does, does FERC actually have the power to do this and, you know, et cetera. But it seems to me that the, the, the main issue that was raised in the petition is, that you alluded to has to do with uh, cross subsidies, right? So the idea that if, if you are selling electricity back uh, to the grid that you have generated, uh, depending on the rate that you're getting, the argument goes, well, uh, you, you're not covering your full freight because there's a, there's, uh, maintenance and capacity, other things that you're not, that aren't, uh, that don't show up in, uh, uh, that, that, you're, that you're not providing to the grid, but you're still getting compensated for the, the whole rate. So, so that's the first question is to what extent is that actually true that there are these cross subsidies going on? You, uh, and then of course the follow-up question is if that's yes, uh, who is better positioned to deal with that, uh, FERC, or states and localities. Um, and so uh, I'll leave this open to the, uh, the panel, but I particularly, uh, Mr. Chairman, interested to hear your thoughts on the comparative uh, knowledge base of FERC versus the states and localities of, you know, who really knows better what's going on on the ground to be able to craft a, a solution here. 
My first thought on that would be their strength in numbers. If you have 50 different people trying to come up with a solution as opposed to one, you're going to cover all of the bases. And as Justice Brandeis, his famous uh, dissent that kind of coined the phrase that the states were the laboratories of democracy, you can try different things and you can and, and and you can see what happens. That's where innovation happens. Um, I don't think that the NERA petition seeks a broad intelligent review of a cost shift. They've already decided. They've already decided that avoided cost is the appropriate rate. Uh, they're not really interested in a broader policy discussion. What they're interested in is using muscle uh, to get their way on that particular question. As you examine the cost shift question in broader context, there's a number of things I think that you have to look at. First of all, there's a reason they're focusing on that particular cost shift. There are other cost shifts that we don't talk about. There are potentially cost shifts between residential and industrial and back and forth. If you're not on time of use rates, there are cost shifts. If your usage is more correlated to the peak, uh, then, then not. There's all kinds of cost shifts. Uh, we examine these cost shifts all the time. And, and, and some of the things that we're seeing, what we sought to do with our solar self-supply is increase the size of these things as uh, a cost mitigation tool. Now, the NERA folks probably wouldn't appreciate that particular cost mitigation tool because generally what they do is support things that make things small scale and then say, well, look at the small scale, it, uh, it costs too much. Well, maybe if you scaled it up, and when you scale into the higher rate classes that have demand charges, uh, you actually see the cost shifts uh, diminish in some instances. So there are a lot of different ways to approach and attack this cost shift. And one of the things that I didn't like about the petition is it seemed to suggest that, you know, states weren't doing anything, when the truth is that they don't like what some of the states are doing and have uh, opportunity uh, to have that view uh, represented. And when you take the risk that we're facing potentially from, from a change in administration imposing costs, um, and it, you know, we need the flexibility to protect ourselves from that eventuality. And a one size fits all doesn't do it. There's a very interesting chart in uh, Nehru's response uh, from Dr. Carl Peckman of NRRI. Uh, they proposed a split jurisdiction. So he presented a chart that showed by different hours of the day as the price moves at different moments in the day and different price points, the, the, the sale uh, transfers and jumps back and forth. Now it's state jurisdictional now it's federal. Now it's state again. Now it's federal. Of course, it's in the peak of the day when it's mostly FERC and the off hours when it's mostly the state. Just looking at that chart, how do you make something like that work? Um, you know, the cost shift is a tough policy. A lot of folks have different views. They have an opportunity to state those views and work through them. We don't need a one size fits all that doesn't seek an open debate. They've already decided it's avoided cost. And if you do avoided cost, typically what you get is an end to solar development and you send your entrepreneurs packing into a different sandbox and that kills innovation. Uh, that's a risk of that. I'm not saying that that would certainly happen, but that's a risk along with all the other risks and benefit that need to be uh, considered as we study these policies. All right. Uh, Chris, did you have? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be slightly more blunt than Chairman Thomas for once. Um, I, I will say that there are, in fact, cost shifts and cost subsidies in, in retail rate making today, oftentimes for very good social purposes. Uh, if you have average rate making, uh, average cost rate making in, uh, for your retail tariff, so if everyone's on a flat rate, there are cost subsidies embedded in that average retail rates between uh, urban customers, suburban customers, and rural customers. But we've made public policy goals to ensure that co that electricity remains affordable. So there are very good policy reasons, social and public policy reasons, why we do allow cross subsidies. Um, there's also other subsidies that are embedded in the rates around the delivery of fuel sources, such as coal or natural gas, that then make those type of resources perhaps more competitive than they ought to be. 
And of course, we, we don't have an appropriate uh, calculation for the cost of carbon, which FERC is going to be talking about uh, in, the, in the upcoming weeks. So there's a, there's a whole slew of costs that are both incurred and are not being incurred that provide sufficient, you know, examples of cost shifting that are occurring all over the place or not occurring. And as Chairman Thomas noted, the NIRA petition seems to be mostly an example of they don't like these cost shifts um, and they prefer these others to, to, for what they like. So like if you read the report, the attached report of their, of Ashley Brown, they, he basically dismisses all the benefits that one goes through in avoided cost methodology or in an M methodology, such as avoided capacity costs due to the growth of distributed solar, the avoided infrastructure costs at the transmission and perhaps at the distribution level because of the greater ability of, of resources located closer to customers. So all of those benefits are just simply pushed to a side and dismissed entirely by the NARA petition as in essence not really being real or existing, which is in my opinion factually untrue that there are costs, there are benefits to these resources sitting out there that you go through the NEM development to identify what are the costs and what are the benefits. And then the regulator then decides what is the appropriate compensation um, for these resources. Yeah, and I'll just jump in really quick. I, I would agree with Chris and, and Chris, you being in Minnesota, I think you have a, a good first uh, firsthand knowledge of this. Minnesota and their value of solar uh, docket tries to do this at, at least for the community solar side. And it gives a good um, example for us to look at to understand just how complicated this is and what, what's really being asked for here in the petition. I believe Minnesota's retail rate on average is somewhere around 14 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, and in the value of solar proceeding that looks at, I think it looks at eight different um, factors or values that solar can bring to the cost um, from capacity, transmission, fuel you mentioned, um, even some environmental characteristics, um, and operations and maintenance costs, things like that. Um, and it settles on a value for that of 11 cents. Well, for the residential customers with solar panels on their homes right now, I think they're being compensated only at about 7.1 cents. Um, and so, and that's the number that NERA wants with this petition. But what Minnesota's done is at least made a, a, a fact-based attempt at identifying the true value which is somewhere in between the full retail and the avoided cost. And so Nira is asking us to go to the low end and just call it good and not worry about the realities of the systems. And I think that state regulators want to take a much more uh, nuanced approach to that. That's, you know, we like to get in the weeds, I think, and, and look through these and try to, try to make those value judgments and, and how we're going to craft policy based on our states and our, and our residents. And so uh, I, I just wanted to point that out as a, a real world example of kind of what we're talking about, about here on, when we're talking about this. All right, good. So uh, I'm gonna do a couple of audience questions. Uh, first, uh, do you think that with the expansion of RTOs nationally, states should look to FERC for guidance on payment for customer generation, uh, something akin to the qualifying facilities rule in order to maintain balance between uh, payment for generation of all types? So if anyone wants to address that, uh, go for it. Balance on energy basis, uh, perhaps. Uh, what about the other values? When you look only at the energy basis, you might be missing other values. Um, that and th to me, the PERPA thing is is illustrative of what the problem is. We've had PERPA since 1978. We have zero solar PERPA projects in Arkansas. Uh, the energy basis doesn't work. It's very difficult to do a long-term contract price as as many states have have struggled with. Uh, we have one project that's under review and I stress that it's under review so it reports. Um, it will be rigorously reviewed 
but it purports uh, not to have a cost shift and the cost shift is mitigated by storage. If that's true, and again, it has to be rigorously advantaged, um, examined to see whether it's true or not. But if it is true, we've captured the value that PERPA tries to capture, which is you should be able to build something if you can do it without uh, touching other people. Um, where we don't have any PERPA projects, but we have a net metering project. And how I'm looking at it in some ways is part of what we're doing with net metering is what I would call early adopter risk. That we're paying a little bit more to get started in something new to see if when we do that, uh, an innovation might emerge. Um, and you know, these, you know, some states might not want to do that, some states might. Uh, that's why we should let the states decide these things. And if in fact we can capture the value that PERPA tries to capture in this, because we started with some degree of cost shift as the utilities defined it and phased it out over time uh, while letting people scale up and build a new industry uh, to try to compete for the next increment of investment, uh, we've done a good thing. Uh, and, you know, NERA who wants to do PERPA, uh, if their petition is granted, might kill a project that unlock the value that PERPA missed. And that's as we scale up and you have demand charges in your rate design and you use storage, but put it back in at one-to-one, -one, you might be able to mitigate cost shift. So you would have a scaled up solar unit without cost shift that gets built while if you say PERPA is the alternative, well, the history is that nothing gets built. Now, again, all of that is subject to rigorous review and we'll debate it, uh, but if it passes that rigorous review, and in fact, you can use storage and the traditional demand rate in a scaled up solar facility to have a large solar facility with no cost shift, uh, whatever cost shift there has been might be worth it because it's resulted in that innovation, which at that scale would give any customer, a city, or well, and it, no, the cities aren't really applicable. Um, it would give customers a free insurance policy uh, against uh, what might be coming uh, in November. Um, you know, my Republican colleagues, and I'm a lifelong Republican, are in the process of uh, following an idiot over a cliff and we could find ourselves at the bottom of a pile of goo and what I must do is protect my ratepayers from that and if through our net metering policy we have developed a large-scale insurance policy uh, with solar um, it's it's very much worth it Okay, uh, certainly going over a, a, a cliff and landing in a pile of goo, uh, I suppose there's, there's worse ways that could end up. <laughs> but- um, Well, name one. <laughs> well, there, could, there could be, you could just crash the bottom of the cliff. Uh, um, no, that's where they're going. Yes, right, right. The goo and, might break the I've fall. been saying that since February of 2017, and you know, folks that know better than me are head, heading right toward that cliff, so we'll see what happens. Right, we have another uh, question from Adrian Moore of Reason, I believe. Uh, says, please expand on how technology improvements and better market understandings uh, allow incorporating distributed generation without net metering. And uh, also, it's kind of a two-parter. Yes, uh, for good examples, uh, states that are that are doing good uh, on this issue, uh, particularly regarding uh, distributed generation. Uh, but but on, you know, what, what states are, are kind of getting this right if you had to single people out? So I'll, I'll try to answer and at least the second part of that question. Um, net, net energy metering is, is, in, is a prevalent mechanism for distributed energy resources like solar to be compensated. There are a handful of places that don't have something called the energy metering. And that's um, here in Minnesota, which has the option, which has, uh, you can use either a value of solar calculation or you can use an energy metering calculation. 
uh, and then of course Austin Energy has their value of solar uh, tariff as well, which is um, has been in place for many years now. So those are those are the two main components. What I would point out, perhaps uh, slightly differently, to answer that question is um, states like like Hawaii and California, which uh, have a significant amount of rooftop solar in their territories. I believe the last thing I heard from uh, when I was talking to my friends at the Hawaii PUC is 40-some-odd uh, percent of their customers in Oahu have rooftop solar on a per-circuit basis. And so what they've been doing there is uh, figuring out what is after an energy metering. Uh, so what is after an energy metering becomes the, that question that needs to be asked is, okay, we have a policy, an energy metering that's in place throughout most of the country. What do we need to do to move forward away from the energy metering? In other words, when does the energy metering serve its purpose? When do we have sufficient rollout of things like solar that makes use of the energy metering? And at what point in time is it time to shift to something else that is not the energy metering? That could be a thing like value distributing to resources, which they've been talking about in New York State for years now um, and still trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, and then the other component of this question which is why it's very important that the states are involved in this, is getting a better understanding of what is occurring in the distribution system. Because if you don't have visibility and technology uh, about what's going on in the distribution system, it becomes incredibly difficult then to generate a price about what you should be compensating or charging these resources at a local level. Um, because if there's no visibility and the utility has just a general sense of what's going on, it's not a very accurate price signal that you would want to send. So if you wanted to move beyond energy metering to, you know, valuing the services and the benefits or charging their costs at locations, you need to have that visibility into the operations distribution system in order for the market and the customers to then identify what resources they want and what mix do they want and where do the optimal location for these resources be cited that do provide a benefit the distribution system. And so some of the states that are looking at distribution system planning, that is one of the purposes for which they would be looking at it is to identify where the distribution system is upgrades needed and where in conjunction with things like distributing energy resources, could these, be, could these resources be better cited or located uh, in order to provide the benefits that um, these resources can provide to the distribution system. There's, there's one point that I would make with respect to time. There's uh, the time element. There's this theme in the questions where if we were at any mature market, I would probably agree. We need price equivalency among various technologies over the long term. Um, the RTO markets are a good, a good place for that. You have a liquid, non-gameable price with respect to the energy side of all of this. But when you look at innovation, if you insist that a new incumbent technology compete on an equal footing with a scale technology on day one, your result is no innovation. Uh, JP Morgan's house was the first residence that had electricity. They probably ran it over other people's property and didn't compensate for them. And he was a rich guy if we'd have dismissed it as a toy for the rich because the rich guy got it first, we wouldn't have electricity. You, you scale up these things and you hope to get there in time. But like, like with 5G, if you couldn't use 4G poles or telephone poles, you, you'd never get to 5G and you wouldn't have gotten to 4G. What you need to do is have some reasonable balance between how do we help new technologies get started as we head towards a mature market uh, where, where you don't need that, that kind of thing. And, and with the climate challenge that we're facing and the potential economic disruption, if people that don't believe in markets prevail in the national debate, it's going to be very expensive and we need to work on these issues and try to use the technology to protect our economy and way of life even as we address the climate change. And when you turn your back on innovation in that context, you're making a grave error, a very costly error in my view. Yeah, uh, so let me 
follow up on that because there's a question that deals with um, how do you translate these issues for the general conservative public? You know, I, one thing about electricity policy, some of these issues is they can get really, really technical uh, very quickly, and uh, there are numbers involved. Uh, I'm a, I, I'm a old attorney, so I don't like numbers. <laughs> That's why I went to law school because there's not supposed to be any math. Um, so how do, how do you uh, translate these issues and get people to care about these issues uh, among the general uh, conservative movement, such as it is, and, and the general general public? How do you bring home the importance of, of matter? Yeah. Well, um, I know from, from our approach at CEN, uh, being a broadly based organization in 21 different states, you know, we we try to find those communicators and those champions locally that can really help communicate these topics in a way that has the, the context for, for local individuals. And whether that's lawmakers or regulators or different things, we try to do that. Um, one of the things with this uh, topic in particular that we we're looking at, um, you know, we're engaging in this at ALEC, for instance, with uh, traditionally conservative uh, lawmakers, we proposed a resolution on this exact issue that said, you know, we we are asking Alec to oppose uh, this type of overreach by the federal government into states, state states issues. And yes, it can get technical when you talk about what is the proper compensation and what variables should be considered in the value of solar. And you know, people can't even read their electric bills, let alone understand than how those numbers are showing up on those line items. And so if we keep it at least at this initial level more about states' rights, innovation, um, and those types of high level benefits, and we have the right messengers in place to do that on a local level, um, I think we can be, we can be more successful in, in doing that. But um, again, we, I guess us policy wonks keep working on the back end with all those numbers trying to, to iron out what is the best policy, but it really takes uh, those people on the front lines in, in front of residents and businesses and families to, to help communicate those um, properly. In my view, it starts with markets. The right has won the market war and lost the market peace. It starts with markets and it's, it's, it's the ridiculous point when you have somebody that attacks markets with their Twitter account that wouldn't work, it wouldn't exist but for market capitalism, on their iPhone that wouldn't exist but for market capitalism, and use these social media to attack market. How do you lose that argument? It, it, it's astonishing uh, that we're not more effective in using the markets. Uh, we used to be really, really good at this. There was a guy named William Buckley and another guy named Martin Feldstein. Martin Feldstein's book was Free to Choose. That started the Reagan Revolution. We used to be about big ideas. Now we're about selling clickbait to people that agree with us while we talk to one third of the population and get rolled while our opponents talk to the whole thing. How do you lose the capitalism versus socialism debate? How is it even close? Look at South Korea. Look what they've done. It was a war zone in, in, in uh, 1955. Look at Singapore, look at China. China's lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty with markets, and they've made markets work in a communist police state. It's remarkable. Start with markets. We win the market battle. But when we as conservatives decide that instead of markets, that the role of conservatives is to defend incumbent businesses rather than to protect consumers from all businesses using markets, uh, we, we go down the wrong path. And that's, I'm afraid, the path that we're on. And I'll just, I'll just note that markets um, used to be actually a very bipartisan solution. Um, the, the deregulation of the airlines was initiated by Senator Ted Kennedy with support from a staffer named Stephen Breyer, who now sits on the, court, the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and then the intellectual uh, 
uh, HEPT was then provided by Alfred Kahn. So these are, these are you know, people out there um, who are very supportive of markets. And over time, for one reason or another, the support of markets has um, not grown, especially you know, not grown or maintained the way that we would have thought it would have considering the success that markets have had across this country. Um, to be, I guess, too intellectual here, I consider myself a classical liberal, which does believe in price transparency, innovation, and market growth, and giving people the opportunity to make to uh, choose what solutions they want in front of them. And um, we've lost that idea, at least as it applies to energy markets, that markets are the remain the optimal way and the most efficient way to identify and sort solutions. And as as we note, there's the protection of monopolies remains one of these impediments from the right that uh, seems to run right up against the traditional view that markets are the are the optimal way of of achieving solutions and and outcomes. Yeah. So uh, we actually have a, a question related to that, sort of, uh, which is if if states are the better decision maker here instead of FERC, uh, what do you do about the influence of IOUs on state PUCs, uh, isn't that a recipe for disaster because utilities are not known for their innovation? Well, I would put the shoe on the other foot. Who do they think is behind the NERA petition? <laughs> That's the very problem with the NERA, NERA, NERA petition. Of course, they've anonymized, so we don't know who they are. And to me, it's not a question of whether an individual state or an individual FERC can figure it out better. You know, markets work because you have a broad base of people and you average. There are dumb market decisions. Just look at all the money that got thrown at, at uh, import terminals for natural gas, even after the fracking revolution uh, had, had started. That doesn't mean you know individuals make, but, but when you have a group, when you have 50 people trying to figure this thing out, as opposed to a one size fits all solution, you're going to do better. But but the IOU influence is, is the is the genesis, in my view, of of the NERA petition. Uh, okay, so we have a, a question here asking, how is renewable energy provided through net metering uh, better than through a qualified qualifying facility uh, process? that would justify the difference there? Well, I, I think Chairman Thomas pointed it out. Uh, from a practical level, it, it exists. <laughs> so I know in, in Arizona, just like in Arkansas, um, I think we last check before I left, we had one qualifying uh, solar facility under PURPA. Um, I think it, in reality, yeah, you're going to see more economies of scale if you can get larger scale, uh, you know, larger scale systems onto the onto the system through PURPA or, or whatever versus rooftop by rooftop. You might achieve economies of scale, but I also think there's an important element of of customer choice here. You know, people want rooftop solar solutions for all types of of different reasons. It's not purely a you know run the numbers economic decision all the time and 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 so I think having some sort of net metering calculation um, or value of solar or whatever format it takes allows those markets to form and for, for customers to have more choice and greater, greater ability to, to use those markets personally. So, uh, I, I mean, that, that's, my mar that's my remark. It's kind of tongue in cheek, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think, uh, unfortunately, I don't know that we're gonna be able to get to uh, all the questions that are there, uh, I'm going to ask one more. I, sh I, I will say, because uh, we had a question of, you know, is everybody on the panel, uh, you know, gung-ho, rah-rah, pro net metering? Um, and I, I believe, as Chris, as you noted, uh, net metering, we're not saying the net metering is necessarily a uh, uh, the, the best or most efficient policy to, you know, even given whatever your goals are. Uh, there are, though, questions of state versus federal jurisdiction and whether states are, are 
best place to make those decisions and to craft what the best policy should be. Um, but uh, I do, so there is a question specific for Chairman Thomas though, that has to do with storage. And it says, can you elaborate on how storage affects uh, cost, shift, cost shift? Uh, so I guess storage relating to cost shift. Uh, that if issue. you have a net metering facility, which is trading energy one for one, regardless of its time value, and then you add storage to that facility, which is designed to capture the higher value of energy during the peak. But since it's net metering and you're doing it one for one, you trade those higher peak hours at one for one, then the value differential can be used to offset uh, the the cost shift on the other. And there's there's some of, there's the theme in the questions, you know, well, everybody's raw, raw, net mirroring is wonderful. I've described it as transitory. Um, it's, it's one step on a process. Um, I don't think it, it, it's a long-term solution, but then again, that's gonna be different from states. If you're in Hawaii, where you have a little bit of land and a lot of people in some places, you have population density, a rooftop is different than it is uh, in my state where we're seeing it's more in the scale. We have wide open spaces, low property value, low um, population density. It's gonna be different from state to state, but it's trans transitory. What I don't want to happen, it it's a first step in innovation. If you kill it right there, you don't get the, the innovation. That doesn't mean it should stay that forever. You should measure whatever detriment you, you think is out there and ask yourself the question, is it worth it over time? Are we innovating? Are we figuring out new ways to create competition for the next increment of generation in the utility field? Are we mitigating um, the impact of, of potential feral carbon? There's all these other questions and it's transitory. It's not net metering one for one forever. Yes, and I, I just will, I'll put in a plug. Uh, R Street a couple years ago put out a significant report on these issues authored by Lynn Kiesling, uh, who some of the audience may know. So uh, unfortunately, I believe we are running to the end of our allotted time. Uh, so I wanna thank all the panelists for uh, joining us and, and enlightening us. And thank you all to all the participants for coming and for engaging with, uh, with the, the questions and with the issue. So thank thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. If you have questions, email them. <laughs>